Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, welcome to the 19th meeting of the Social Security Committee. Can I remind everyone to turn off their mobile phones? It does interfere with the sound system. Can I just uh, welcome our guests and our witnesses here today? Thank you very much. I know it's been an early start, uh, an early travel start for yourself. So uh, basically we will go on to, first of all, agenda item one, and that is uh, increased time to consider the bill. And can I ask the committee if they're content to decide to take this agenda item four in private? Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Agenda item two, as I said, previous is continuation of the evidence of the, the bill and uh, with two panels of witnesses today and I'd just like to welcome Bill Scott, Director of Policy Inclusion Scotland, Mona Simpkins, Scottish Director of MS Society and Stephen McAvoy, Senior Welfare Rights Advisor in Able Scotland. And I know that you're taking the place of Kayleigh Thorpe. Yes, thank you very much for, for, for coming in. I'm going to start off the question. It might seem a very simple question, uh, and it is a simple question. I don't know what the answers may be, uh, but I would like to ask uh, each of you, uh, in your opinion, what is the greatest strength or weakness of the proposed bill in relation to the people you represent? I don't expect me to give me all of all of them, because there's lots of around the table here. Committee members will want to ask you, but what would you say was either the greatest strength or weaknesses of the proposed bill in relation to the people you represent? Bill Scott, I'll start with you. I think um, that uh, we would consider the greatest strength uh, some of the principles in the bill. Uh, that uh, Social Security is seen as an investment in people um, to realise their potential. Um, to live in society, um, that uh, people using the system will be treated with dignity and respect. These are important rights um, that disabled people have sought for many years um, in the current system, UK system, and often been denied them. Um, so, you know, we see those sort of principles underpinning the bill as being an important signal of how Social Security will be delivered in the future. So I think that's that's the, the greatest quality of the bill, is, is, is that human rights-based approach. Okay. Uh, I was going to say weaknesses, but I'm sure you can come on <laughs> to that. On that. <laughs> and uh, and the questions, uh, Mona. Thank you. Um, we, I'd also echo uh, Bill's comment. I think we welcome the principles in the bill. Um, we were pleased to um, see the charter um, being referenced as well. And obviously, we want to see and welcome the embedding of human rights within them. And I think what we hope is that this approach will help tackle some of the, the issues like stigma, which is sadly around uh, for many people that claim benefits, let, you know, also people affected by MS. Thank you very much. Stephen? I think we would echo that on the principles um, and also some extra support for carers as well. Okay, very succinct then. I'll, I'll open it up and I'm sure there'll be other questions come in on various other issues. Adam Tomkins, do you want to come in on? Thank you. Uh, convenient. Good morning, everyone. Um, uh, I want to ask you about um, the structure of the bill. Um, uh, and there are a number of questions around the structure of the bill that we've explored with um, uh, in previous evidence sessions, including the legal status of the Charter, the enforceability of the rights that Bill Scott just talked about. But, uh, and feel free, free, feel free to reflect on any of those issues if you, if you want to. But the specific question I want to ask you is about the relationship in the bill between primary and secondary legislation. Um, and that might seem like an arcane lawyer's point, but actually it goes to the kind of core of what we're trying to do, which is to expose the newly created devolved Scottish social security system to as much parliamentary scrutiny, to as much openness and as much transparency as possible. Clearly it's the case that this parliament is able to scrutinize primary legislation more fully than it's able to scrutinize delegated legislation. And Again, it's clearly the case that the Parliament is able to scrutinise delegated legislation more fully than it's able to scrutinise guidance or other forms of informal rulemaking that might govern the way in which the new Scottish Social Security Agency gets on with the job um, that it's um, going to be required to do. In their evidence, Sam H have argued that key principles should be placed within the bill itself rather than regulations. Um, uh, inclusion, say that the people that they consulted were very concerned by the lack of detail of eligibility criteria in the bill. Enable argued 
uh, that the purpose of benefits and a framework for their operation should be placed on the face of the bill. So the question is, in your view, does the bill get the relationship right between primary legislation, secondary legislation and informal guidance? Who wants to come in first? Uh, Stephen. Um, I will be representing people at Social Security Tribunal, so I'm very interested um, in the, the legislation. Um, I think that in terms of the principles, there is a comparison um, at Social Security Appeal Tribunals. There's an overriding objective rule um, that tribunals must deal with issues fairly and justly. And I think if we had a similar rule in the Social Security Bill, that that might actually give a way to give some practical um, redress where those uh, principles are breached for people. Um, I think in terms of what's in the primary legislation, um, there are some bits that could be strengthened. We've been quite clear that on disability benefits, we would like to see it made clear that the purpose of disability benefits are that they're a cash transfer and that they're paid to cover the additional costs that arise through disability. Um, and I think in the bill, although I can see reasons why you wouldn't want necessarily every small detail in the, the bill, I think that setting out the actual overarching purpose of each benefit gives you a framework to work against and then to measure whether or not you're actually being successful. Mona. Obviously support my colleagues. I think what um, in our written response to the committee, we said that much of the, the stuff that would impact somebody who obviously lives with MS, which is a very unpredictable condition, um, is not on the, the face of the bill, but rather in the regulations uh, and things that we would alert the committee to are like timescales and uh, entitlement cr criteria. As I said, it is a very unpredictable condition and we want to, to allow people to plan and have some certainty in their life and we feel that if those were included in the bill rather than in the principles, it would provide that greater certainty. Thank you. Bill Scott. Yeah. I, you know, we said in our evidence, and I think I continue to believe, that I don't think the balance is right in the bill between primary legislation and regulations. Um, however, we are where we are. <laughs> Um, and um, we were um, in discussions with the Minister um, about entitlement criteria, which is where we've got a particular concern around disability benefits. Um, and the Minister was open to an amendment um, which uh, would have placed entitlement criteria on the face of the bill uh, for disability benefits, although she was also saying that uh, if we did that, we would have to think about entitlement criteria for the other benefits as well. Yeah. Um, now, we seriously looked at that. My, you know, the policy team for Inclusion Scotland, um, the uh, policy officer for Camp Hill, who's been working with us to draft some amendments um, for several days. And the problem that we have is uh, we're a membership-based organisation and disabled people make our policy, not me mm -hmm. uh, or, or the CAO or, e or even the board. Um, so normally um, we're given general direction as to, to yeah. what policies to pursue, but on something like this, which is so essential to the lives of disabled people, we would have wanted to enter into detailed consultation with them about what entitlement criteria they would want to see for the new disability benefits. Um, because when we did consult last year on the, um, on the document, your know, future of social security in Scotland, um, there was no general agreement about whether we should take a DLA-based type approach or a personal independence payment type approach. Uh, I think there was near unanimity that we would like to see a return of the 50 metre walking rule, sure. um, but on the daily living component and the care component, there was not that sort of consensus. So we would have had to work with people for quite some time to probably narrow it down to make sure that the entitlement criteria that we were proposing were in line with disabled people's wishes. Mm. And we don't have the time to do that in, in, in the time for the uh, further consideration of the bill and to put amendments in place. I mean, simply put, we, we ran four consultation events across Scotland last year, um, engaged with you know, 160, 170 disabled people, and we engaged with disabled people online through social media. Um, several hundred took part in that. So 
we, we had a fair basis on, on which to, to give a, a response then. We don't at the moment. And, and, and I think it, it's the practicalities and that we would wish to see those entitlement criteria definitely in line with disabled people's wishes that prevents us from bringing forward an amendment to that effect. That, 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 that's a very full and very, and very helpful answer. Thank you, th th thank you very much. And, and you're absolutely right that it's the practicalities that, that, we're, that we're concerned with, that all of us around the table are concerned with with regard to this bill. But, but I, I just wonder then where that leaves us. I mean, your opening remark, Mr yeah. Scott, was that the bill gets the balance wrong. Yeah. And your closing remark was there isn't very much we can do about it because we don't have enough time. Yeah. Is, that, is, that, is that your advice? No. No. Uh, so we came to that conclusion and, and I had a meeting with the Minister last week and the Minister was still keen to offer reassurance to disabled people that the criteria could not be changed easily uh, once they are set and that there would be consult consultation on the entitlement criteria before they were set. And she agreed that um, the super affirmative procedure would be used um, when the entitlement criteria were put before Parliament. And that would allow organisations like ourselves, enable uh, the MS Society, uh, SAMI H, etc., to make representations to the committee about whether those entitlement criteria were in line with disabled people's needs. And we would have the, ch the chance then to carry out the sort of consultation on the entitlement criteria that we, we would like, like to do. And further, that any changes to such regulations in the future would also be subject to a super affirmative procedure. So again, that would give some reassurance that they could not be changed easily um, without public consultation. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very okay. much. Thank you. Uh, two supplementary. Ruth Maguire, then Paul McNeil. Thanks, Convener. It was briefly, I guess, though, you've actually, you've almost answered it, because I, <laughs> I was going to say, is, is that one of the benefits of having it in secondary legislation, is that you can have that extensive consultation that, that you want, I guess, if you're going to get the extensive consultation anyway? That's... Um, we, we could have done that if it had been in the primary legislation as well. If, mm -hmm. if we'd had that over the summer, we could have done that okay. sort of consultation. But because they weren't on the face of the bill, we couldn't, we mm -hmm. couldn't ask people do you like these entitlement criteria, would mm. you like other ones, etc. So it could have been done either way, but as I say, I, I, I do still believe the balance is, is a bit wrong, but okay. you know, I think that some of the, there will be a great deal of reassurance for the super affirmative procedure being used. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Paul, I you want to the supplementary? <coughs> I do, I mean, I think this is the central area for the, the committee to scrutinise and make sure we've understood the evidence and that we can take a view on, on the balance. So, um, just so presumably from the evidence you've given, that if, if we get more principles into the primary legislation, then that would be a protection because the principles, the regulations, <coughs> should not um, undermine the basic principles. Yeah. Um, but secondly, um, I just want to be clear about this. Are you content then? If you're consulted on the regulations, let's say, and entitlement to disability benefits, if you have a say in that, and they are in the regulation and not the primary legislation, and if that's the model for other benefits, is that the right balance or not? I mean, I think the committee need a steer to be clear on this. <laughs> this. Okay, Mr Scott, you want to come in, and other yeah, members yeah. that can come in if they, if they wish and the witnesses. Yeah. Okay. Um, yes, well, let's see, we would like to see some of the parts strengthened in the bill, um, particularly disability benefits, to make it clear that it's a cash transfer, non-means-tested benefit, and the specific purpose is that it's intended to cover that cost that arise through disability. Also, carers' allowance, that it's an earnings replacement benefit, again, really setting out clearly what the, the purposes of each of the benefits are. Um, and then within the regulations, if they were properly scrutinised, um, then I think that, that that could potentially be a way forward. Mona, did you want to come in? Oh, sorry. But in, in the bill, I think it's really important to have the purpose of the benefit so that you know the, what you're measuring the regulations against. Mm. Mona? We would support that, and as we've said already, you know, timescales over decisions and things like that we would want to see in the bill as well. And Bill, did you want to come back on that yeah, one? Yeah, there's definitely things we would still like to see in the face of the bill. Um, uh, for example, around overpayments, um, where we don't think that the bill uh, is in line with the policy intent. 
you know, the word on the bill. So, so definitely changes we'd still like to see. Uh, but again, on, on the matter of the principles, um, we prepared an amendment that um, ministers have to give due regard to the principles in exercising their functions as ministers. And that, we believe, again, would make the principles stronger and more effective in action because in doing anything in certain regulations, etc., they would have to give regard to those principles in certain regulations. Thank you. Alison Johnson, you wanted to come in. It's still on this, the same point. It, it, it's about the issue of future-proofing too. It sounds as if you're having constructive discussions with the current government and the current CAPSEC. But what if that changes? I mean, you say in your own submission, you know, I've raised this issue of the UK uh, government undermining a, a tribunal decision on PIP eligibility previously by using secondary legislation, and you point out um, that, that part of your fear is around the fact that the UK government recently made changes to the scope of entitlement to PIP um, via changes to the regulations. I mean, can this be future-proofed? You know, even if you have a really good relationship with the current government, is it enough? You know, we may have a different government in future who may simply disregard or, or find it easier to disregard agendas set in secondary yeah. legislation. If, if, I mean, if, if the super affirmative procedure is on the face of the bill, then it will be very difficult for a future government to ignore that because they'd have to, again, change the primary legislation to get round it. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it does provide some degree of reassurance that it will not be an easy change and that there will be the chance for ourselves and you know, others to mount a campaign against changes which we um, you know, don't agree with. Um, you know, my absolute preference would have been for them to be on the face of the bill. Yeah. But I th we are where we are, as I say, and, and we, I think we've worked with the bill as it is. I think the greatest degree of reassurance that we can be offered is use of super affirmative, and if possible, also, um, you know, a reference to uh, a Scottish Social Security Advisory Committee, um, and uh, like the UK one, um, if, if, if such a, a body was brought into being, again, that would again pro provide some reassurance because they would provide independent advice to the, both the Social Security Committee and the Minister about how regulations would affect um, recipients. So, again, that, that would hopefully provide some reassurance to current recipients that they couldn't easily change things without somebody having something to say about it. <laughs> yeah. okay, thank you. Yeah. Any other witnesses want to come in on that one? Jeremy Balfour, you wanted a supplementary on it as well. Yeah, I mean, I think it's just following up on, on, on what you've been saying. Uh, and it's just been interesting to get your views, perhaps particularly Stephen, with his kind of tribunal experience, in that there is a reasonable amount of latitude within interpretation of both, D or particularly DLA, but also to some degree of PIP. And you do end up with tribunals can reach some very different decisions around upper tiers and even to the House of Law, or well, the Supreme Court now. Um, would you want to see the regulations a lot tighter? So it's a very clear who's in, who's out, or do you think this flexibility of interpretation is helpful? Stephen. Okay. I think it will be very difficult to ever design the regulations where disputes and people who fall between grey areas don't arise. Um, disability benefits, the entitlement rules are only ever really a means of calibrating disabilities. And when these benefits are intended to cover such a wide range of people with different conditions and combined conditions, I think that's always going to be very, very difficult to get an absolutely 100% perfect system. Um, if you leave them relatively open, it gives, gives a kind of degree of flexibility um, for people who sort of don't necessarily fall completely in the rules. Um, we have looked at a potential way where we could still have the regulations fixed, but allow people who still desperately need that support to fall within the criteria. Under um, employment support allowance, there are exceptional circumstances rules um, where you can show that if a person doesn't meet the ordinary criteria, but there would be a substantial risk to that person if they were found to not be entitled to the benefit, that you can actually use those exceptional circumstances rules to still give the person entitlement. And that might well be a means so that you could have firm regulations about who qualifies, but also have an exceptional circumstance criteria where somebody with a disability who would otherwise be quite at a severe disadvantage if they didn't qualify for support could get in via that route. Okay. Thank you. 
Thank Anyone you. else want to answer that question on, on the panel? Mona? I think we would echo that and I think we would welcome the criteria to be um, more defined as well. Uh, I think we would want it to make sure that it does recognise that unpredictable fluctuating condition and just, you know, not to go over what's happened previously in that one in three people with MS who received a previous higher rate mobility component of DLA had their payments cut after being reassessed for PIP. We want to avoid things like this happening in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Just to, Very quickly, then. Just on that issue, because, again, I'd be interested to get you these very, very briefly on the two tests around a typical day is, is obviously quite difficult for some conditions, particularly something like MS, and also uh, future, you know, because no one knows how long the condition will continue, will it, how it will work. How do we, because I think we're all concerned in this committee, is what happens at the coalface, you know, we can talk about great principles, but it's when somebody applies for something, how do we get on? So can you give us some kind of guidance on how would you get around the issue of a snap snot of one day, would you, we, how would you redefine that? Mona, sorry, I think as I said, it, and you probably already know the unpredictability of MS, it yep. is a long-term condition, it's not something that there is currently any cure for. Um, and I think the things that make it difficult in the current system is, you know, the 20 metre rule, for example, that just doesn't work for someone with MS because you could wake up tomorrow morning and be able to walk 20 metres and the next day not walk at all. Um, so I think we want to make sure that the criteria captures conditions like MS and unpredictability of it and that, you know, people are actually assessed by people that understand the medical condition. Oh, Stephen. Um, I think that's one of the ways where um, disability loving allowance was um, slightly better than the personal independence payment because the personal independence payment is clear that it needs to be the majority of the days, mm -hmm. whereas under disability loving allowance decision makers were supposed to take a step back and look at the overall pattern of the person's life when deciding whether or not they met the criteria. Um, so I think that's one of the ways that DLA was definitely better for fluctuating conditions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Kevina. Okay. Uh, George Adams and Alison George, do you want to come in with a small one after George? And then. Thank you, convener. Uh, good morning, everyone. At this point, can I declare my membership of the MS Society? Because Stacey has MS since she was 16 year old, and I'm only too aware of uh, the, the things you have to deal with in the MS Society. But one of the, just to go follow on from what was said there, is it not the case that the problem is with the current system? is that we have a situation where the, it's so flawed that individuals are obviously getting knocked back for PIP during the, the transition period, and about 60% are actually getting it in, uh, in appeal. And is it also not the case that I think uh, Bill mentioned before some other evidence that he gave us that, you know, the older system was a paper-based system and it was found it was less than 1% or something like that was actually fraudulent, which in Social Security terms is incredible. You know, the, so is it not a case that this new bill actually puts out a way that we can actually deal with the, the dignity and respect thing, but make sure that we can actually do it in such a way that people, like people that have MS, are treated in a way that they, they actually uh, get what they need, as opposed to the current ways, walk that 20 metres, well, I could do it today if I've got MS, but I'll be in my bed for the next week. You know, so is it not the case that we're kind of moving towards that, moving away from the heartless condition that it is currently now with the PIP, and moving on to something a lot more, a lot better for individuals, using the individual as a base. Absolutely. And, and certainly one of the things we've said is that, you know, we believe that we would like MS to be included in one of those conditions that doesn't have to go through that face-to-face -face assessment. And we've discussed this with the Minister already, and that's been uh, quite welcomed. So, yes, absolutely. And, you know, is that... As George says, you know, that unpredictability of the condition and the fact that, you know, we know someone living with a neurological condition, £200 extra a week, it costs them to, to you know, just exist with that. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think that will be determined by the regulations that come forward <laughs> on, on assessments. Um, but um, I think, again, the current policy intent and the commitments given by the Minister are that there will be fewer face-to-face uh, -face assessments. And I think that is a step forward because I, I think a lot could be de determined 
um, from evidence that already exists, care assessments, your know, GPs, um, uh, health records, um, CPNs, uh, opinions, uh, etc., about um, how the condition or impairment affects um, the disabled person's functionality, because that's what PIP uh, assessment really measures. So if there were far fewer face-to-face -face assessments and there were longer awards, um, which would also reduce the number of assessments because people were being reassessed. Um, and in fact, some people who only transferred to, from DLA to PIP um, less than uh, two years ago are already being reassessed um, mm -hmm. because the rewards were only two years and they were backdated to when they claimed and they quite often weren't assessed for five or six months after the claim. So you know, the idea that somebody you know, only gets an award and about a year later has to go through another assessment process to determine exactly the same things as before it just seems ludicrous to us and a waste of public money. So. You know, if, 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 if there is a follow-through in regulations that do look to a more paper-based approach um, where all the evidence is collected prior to a decision being made, I think that that will improve things for everybody. Um, it will reduce the public expenditure and it will also give a certain amount of certainty and reduce the stress for disabled people who have to go through that process. Because that, that snapshot is, is, is very unfortunate because for people with fluctuating conditions, you know, people with mental health conditions, you know, we've, we've seen people denied the benefit on the basis that they wore makeup and were well dressed when they attended the assessment and that that was evidence that they, they weren't severely depressed. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's just not on, you know. So, you know, we, sh we should be looking at the, all the evidence in the round and, and making a determination. And as I say, I hope that reduces the number of face-to-face -face assessments um, and the number of repeat assessments that have to be made. Stephen, did you want to come on on that before? Um, I think the regulations will obviously be really important, um, but there has been a historical issue across benefits. I've seen really poor assessments and decision making under incapacity benefit, employment support allowance, disability allowance, allowance attendance allowance and PIP. So while the regulations will be important, I think we need to fix what goes on behind that. Because irrespective of the benefit that's being assessed, the decision-making quality has been so poor historically that I think that there's something else behind it that needs fixed as well about how the actual regulations are applied. Um, and that's about the evidence that's gathered empowering decision-makers so that they can actually go to the most appropriate source rather than just do things by rote. And, and just fixing some of the kind of silly examples, our, our appeal success rate is well into the 90%, and I would like to say that's because we are so good. <laughs> but if the decision making was of a better standard, it clearly wouldn't, wouldn't be at that level. And we're representing people at appeal, for example, recently a man who gets 24 hour support given no mobility, mm -hmm. yet he gets a hand enhanced at tribunal. People who attend additional support need school, um, getting no points for communication or reading or budgeting just things that could be fixed very, very easily. So while the regulations will be really, really important, I think it's, it's important to focus on how they're applied as well, because that is, is where really the person gets the letter through the door telling them what their entitlement is. That, is. No, we've all been to various events uh, with the minister, and the minister said that that's the kind of, mm -hmm. it's a question for us to ask when she comes here, but that's the kind of, the, the kind of road that she's wanting to take, getting it right first time effectively so that we don't have a situation of going down the people going through the whole process because it's the process itself that causes more heartache than anything else. Yes, and it's already been said, distress um, for something like MS can cause a major relapse, so mm -hmm. that's exactly what we want to avoid. Okay, yeah. thanks. Alison Jordan, do you still want to come in the supplementary? Yeah, one? I mean, just very briefly, it does sound that this is, this is absolutely key to this whole process, and it, in far too many instances it's been going horribly wrong. I, I think I feel astonished that given we've got advice from physios, consultants, GPs and so on, people are still being subjected to this, in many instances, non-expert assessment, which is resulting in them losing cash, being very stressed and becoming even more unwell. Do you think regulation is the right place to have this? I mean, are we giving this area enough attention, given that it's so key to people's day-to-day -day life? Bill Scott. I, th I think it's ex extremely difficult 
um, in primary legislation to set out. And I, I think Stephen's also correct, the way that regulations are interpreted is, is also very important. Um, and, and the standard of decision making. And these aren't things that you can always change by legislation. It's, part, it's about the ethos of the agency uh, in the future. Um, it's about leadership, um, you know, at a political level and within the new agency um, that will set the standards that, that people look to. Um, I've, I've been taking part in a duration of awards working group, um, which is a subcommittee, let's say, of uh, the uh, stakeholder group for disability and carers' benefits. And you know, the duration of awards is, is, is a key issue because PIP, um, for example, makes an assumption that awards will be short, um, will be one, two, three years. Uh, and yet, um, many, many disabled people, as we said, have lifetime conditions. And many of those, even though variable, are not likely to improve. That's, and that's the key. They may, they may get worse. <laughs> In other words, quite often progressive conditions. Um, so if somebody's been awarded at the highest rate for mobility and daily living component um, on the basis of a lifetime condition, what is the point of assessing them again? You know, I, 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 I can see no rhyme or reason um, that, that somebody should be subjected to an assessment when there's no prospect of improvement. So there should have been and could have been no improvement in functionality. So in, in those terms, if, if, again, if the new agency adopts regulations where there is the possibility of longer awards, um, uh, then that should hopefully improve things for disabled people because even if decision making doesn't improve that much, uh, you know, people will still be in, entitled for longer periods once, once they get an award. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank, thank, thank you. Mark Griffin, you wanted to come in. Yep. Thanks, Kevin. I think I wanted to ask about um, assistance in cash or in kind. I think Stephen's been pretty clear on this so far, but just to ask uh, Morna and Bill what their views were on whether assistance should be provided um, in cash by default or not? We would support the calls by other organisations that cash benefits should be the default position. Um, as I've already said, there's additional costs of living with that neurological condition, such as MS, and we feel that cash awards provide that <coughs> greater certainty and allow that flexibility for people to live as well as they can with something like MS. So. Any other witnesses want to come back in that particular one? We, we have exactly the same point of view that currently all disability benefits are provided as cash assistance and even where a disabled person chooses uh, to use their cash in another way, for example, at least a mobility vehicle, they still have an underlying entitlement to the cash assistance. Um, so it isn't in kind support even when it is a mobility vehicle that's being used. Um, because it's their choice to lease it, it's their choice to use their money in that way. And simply, what, what the arrangement is that um, the DWP pays their benefit to um, the mobility scheme rather than direct to the person. And that's almost like an arrangement like we rent, where you would pay direct to the landlord rather than, than to the tenant. It doesn't mean that you're not entitled to housing benefit, you still retain your entitlement, but you've, you've chosen. Uh, where, where that payment will go. And that's what we would like in the future, that people, if they are offered in-kind sport, for example, reduced fuel bills, that that is a choice they make um, rather than uh, one imposed on them. So, yeah, cash is the default. Mm. Mark, do you want to come back in? Yep. That seems to be the government's position as well, that in their policy papers they've set out that um, cash assistance should be given in all instances except where the applicant makes the choice and it is clearly not a choice of the agency to, mm. to make that decision. I wonder whether you feel that that um, should be um, on the face of the bill so that that is set out clearly and that um, there can be no uh, movement away from that. Yeah, absolutely. We, again, we, we think that's an instance where the policy intent isn't matched by the wording of the bill. Uh, the wording of the bill would allow the agency to substitute um, <coughs> cash payments for in-kind assistance. Um, and and we, we would prefer if an amendment was brought forward and, a, and 
the indications are that the Minister is going to bring an amendment forward on that um, to, to ensure that it, it's a clear choice <coughs> made by uh, the claimant or the recipient of the benefit if, if they choose um, to take in-kind support rather than cash. Okay, thank you. I know Jeremy Balfour, you want to come in there. A very small supplementary. I'm, I'm interested in this. In, because at the moment, all you can get for PIP out with the mobility show for the care factor is, is money. Do you think it could be reversed the other way around? That it would, if the claimant would like it, that in, they could get some kind of actual practical help rather than a cash payment? Because for some people, depending on where we live, the cash payment doesn't actually meet the cost of the service that they require. And if there was a statutory duty to say somebody needed somebody to come into the house one hour a day and that would be provided, if that was an option, would you like that in the bill or do you think the cash is still the best way forward? I still think that cash is the best way forward because if we're moving towards a self-directed support system where social care, care um, is, is provided as cash, to uh, the recipient, to, for them to make the choices of who, who provides their care and when it's provided and in what forum, then I can't see that you know, bringing that into the benefit system where you give them less choice would, would, would really make sense. Anyone else want to come back in on that one before I bring in Ruth Maguire? Okay. That fine, ma? Uh, Ruth Maguire. Thank you, convener. Good morning, panel. Um, I wanted to ask you about independent mm -hmm. advocacy. Mm -hmm. we've, we've heard a fair bit of evidence on that. Um, and I would maybe reflect that it, it, it seems to mean different things to different people. So I'd be interested to hear how the panel would define advocacy and what makes that different from advice and representation. Um. We have um, put together uh, an amendment uh, along with um, several other organisations, Disability Agenda Scotland, uh, Scottish Independent Advocacy Alliance, Camp Hill, um, Advocat, um, and uh, the Alliance uh, for Health and Social Care. Um, because we believe advocacy is an essential for some groups of disabled people. It's not advice. Um, I uh, have, have to be very clear about that. Um, advice workers of, often talk about being advocates on behalf of uh, your know, claimants, disabled people. Um, but an advocacy worker pro, uh, performs a, a, a really essential role for people with learning difficulties, mental health issues, some cognitive impairments like autism, um, people with brain injuries, etc. Which, which is that the advocate um, tries to make intelligible the questions that are being put to the disabled person. It's almost like having a translator in place um, where they try to get the disabled person to understand the nature of the question and then try to get to the, the answer that is required rather than the answer that the disabled person might immediately give. So, for example, often learning disabled people, and I go back to self-directed support, are, are often told to say that they can manage a budget to get self-directed self support, mm -hmm. right? So, in one scenario, a social worker has asked them, if we gave you that money, could you manage it? Yes, is, is the answer that they've been encouraged to give. But it's yes with support. <laughs> like they couldn't really manage the money on their own, they would need to do it with support. But the answer that they're asked in a PIP assessment is, can you manage a budget? Well, they've been told before that the answer they're supposed to give is yes. So they say yes. So they get no points. Right? But there's no way they could manage a budget without support. So an advocacy worker's role in there is to, is to drill down and get to the answer that the disabled person... To make sure the disabled person really understands the nature of the question so, and gives a full answer mm -hmm. rather than just the immediate answer that they may give. With an advocacy Do worker there. Do you want, want to back in with yeah. the for yeah. Sorry, just briefly. Yeah. I don't, that advocacy, you're using the term advocacy worker, but yeah. I suppose that someone to advocate for the, the disabled person can be someone who they choose. And yeah. is that could be a peer it's, advocate. Not, it's not a, but the, necessarily the, a professional? Yeah. There are, it could be a peer advocate, but you know, um, the Mental Health Act in Scotland actually 
defines advocacy okay. and um, says in what circumstances it can be provided. And we would like to see a similar right embedded in the social security legislation to ensure that those disabled people with greatest need for advocacy were able to access professional advocacy okay. support. Um, of course, they can choose somebody else to be their advocate. We're not, we're, we're not saying they can't, but again, it should be a choice open to them that they can obtain that support when it's needed. Because quite often, again, for, for example, a lot of learned disabled people, they, and they'll live, you know, hopefully, into their old age, but their parents might die when they're in their 50s. And they might have been their advocates. They might have been the people dealing with social security, et cetera, for them. And all of a sudden, they're deprived of that. And who advocates on their behalf then? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Any other witnesses want to go in, Stephen? Um, we are quite clear that um, advocacy and advice is really, really important for people. Um, with relatively small projects across the last three, four years, we have helped people to claim over £4 million in unclaimed benefits. Um, and we are hitting a lot of client groups that necessarily maybe wouldn't go to traditional advice services because we're a bespoke service for people who learn disabilities of families and carers. Um, we've built up referral networks with other professionals um, and they're able to refer into us clients for that extra support. Um, and it's people who might never ordinarily contact an advice centre um, and we're able to maximise their income. So I think it's really important, one, to have advice, but also to have it across a range of services as well. Um, the other thing I think that we are quite keen on being taken into account is the complexity um, that's building and actually providing advice and how important it is that it's properly funded so that there's stability and the, the resources that are available to provide that. Um, new benefits have been introduced, universal credit, that system is working alongside the legacy benefit system, then you have the devolution of benefits. So it's a system that was already complicated which is getting increasingly so. Um, and it's important that people have not just advice, but good advice as well, advice that's up to date. Would, would you agree with Bill, though, that advice and advocacy are two quite different things? They are different. I would say that advice um, in terms of social security is quite specific. Um, it's about helping the person maximise their entitlement. How should the legislation be interpreted, um, representing the tribunals? Whereas advocacy can be used across a range of settings. It could be health, any decision really that the person's got to make, legal health. Um, so I think that they are separate and there's a need for both. Um, I think specifically in reference to social security, there is a real need for representation. Because while an advocate can provide an important role in terms of getting the person's message across, representatives are able to help the person challenge and also challenge to a level that maybe a person who was unsupported wouldn't be able to do. So upper tribunals, that kind of stuff, and the actual interpretation of the legislation. Okay, thank you. Mona, do you want to go in this one? I just obviously agree with my colleagues. We, we feel the same way, that there should be provision for advice and advocacy, and that they are fundamentally two different things. Um, and we would support that being put into the bill. And just obviously from an MS point of view, um, that is really important, because 80% of our members said that you know they found a whole uh, process of claiming benefits very stressful and there is obviously the huge cognitive issues associated with MS so there is yeah. that need for that pre-advice and entitlement and obviously advocacy uh, as appropriate. Can I say it, also, uh, it would also be in line with the, the, the idea that the Minister has and that this new agency has in getting it right first time mm -hmm. because if, if, if you can give somebody access to a service that helps them be understood um, that lets them be heard by professionals who are doing the assessments, etc. Whether the you know officials in the new agency or health professionals, um, and and better understand the system that they're trying to navigate their way through, then you the, the you're more likely to get the correct information from the get go rather than having to go to an appeal tribunal mm -hmm. to argue the difference because. You know, the information you supplied at an early stage, while not incorrect, mm -hmm. didn't expand to, to the extent that somebody who you know, um, is, is, has no learning difficulties or no mental health issues or cognitive impairments, etc., would have any difficulty in doing and negotiating the way through. So I, I, we think it would improve decision making because you would get the correct evidence at an early stage. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Ben McPherson wants to come in. 
Th thank you, convener. Good, good morning, panel. Just, just on the same points, I, th I think this is, is very important, and Advocard in my constituency have, have been in touch with me about it already. The, I think the distinction there between advocacy and advice is, is really helpful for us, as is the commentary on it at 3.9 and in, in, inclusions uh, submission. The, so, essentially what you're proposing if would be advocacy across a range of different scenarios per se and for individuals with, in certain circumstances, for example, with, with certain disabilities. But with independent, with the, the point about advice, if the agency was able to get the advice right, as in the Scottish Social Security Agency, do you think there would still be a necessity for independent advice? Or is that a manifestation that, that, that uh, seeing that as a, as a necessity is, in, in the current scenario, is that a, a manifestation of the way that Social Security is managed at present under the DWP? Is that, is that, is that clear what, what I'm asking? So I think that's it's, it's quite complicated. Um, I think that um, even if we managed to get the devolved system 100% perfect, um, we would still have the UK system and we would still have the devolved system's interaction with the UK system. So I think that clients will still need somebody who is able to understand the whole picture and advise them. So if the person maybe gets a devolved benefit, does that change their entitlement to a reserve benefit? Um, are they able to claim other things? So I think that there would still be a need for that. Um, I very much doubt there will ever be a system. Like I said, disability benefits are only ever really a means of calibrating disabilities. And there will always be objective opinion, so there will always be disagreements. And I think, therefore, there will always be a need for an independent person to look at the person, go through their case, um, and then support them to challenge it if necessary. Um, so even within a 100% perfect system, I still think there would be a need for advice. Because what is sometimes important to the person is, even if they're not entitled, is that that is explained properly and that the person gets a real grasp of why they're not entitled. Um, and it's not that they've been treated unfairly, these are the rules. And sometimes somebody even providing that independently can give them that reassurance, um, rather than just the, the agency's interpretation of why they're not entitled. And we also need advice services to challenge the legislation, because the legislation as it's written, and maybe originally intended, can always be ex expanded through case law. Yeah, I, I, I'm, you know, my, my years as an advice worker are now so long ago. <laughs> uh, but anyway, um, when I did it, um, it, it, it is really important because it is case law that expands the understanding of what the intention of policymakers often is. So, for example, with the 50 metre rule, or 50 yard rule as it was when it was introduced, um, the, um, the intention was obviously, to provide assistance to people who had um, mobility issues. Um, what was tested in tribunal was, um, is it just a test of whether you can physically walk 50 yards, or is it a test of whether you can walk 50 yards repeatedly, safely, etc.? And that's what the tribunals decided, right. that actually it's not just a simple yes or no, it's can you do this on a, a repeated basis safely? Um, because if you can't, you still, you still pass the test in that, in, in that sense and, and should get the award. So I, I would still see a need for independent advice to continue to test you know, how the regulations uh, and, and primary legislation work in practice. But there should be less need of independent advice to go to tribunal if more decisions are made correctly at, at the get-go. So you know, at one and the same time, there is still a need for independent advice but there might not be as great a need as under the current system. So it's, you know, it's hard, hard to tell in advance of the new system being in place whether the need will reduce or not. But you know, at the moment, if, if intentions carry through in practice, then there might be less need. But there will still be the need at a UK level and in the interaction, as Stephen said. Mm -hmm. just, just very quickly, can quickly you, so, uh, just to pick up on something, um, Stephen McAvoy said, you're absolutely right to say that, of course, there will be practically a, a, a need to think about the interaction between the reserved and the, and the devolved system. But given this is a social security bill on the Scottish social security system as defined 
uh, as relevant to the, the devolved benefits only? Um, would it be understandable to you if there was only a, a right to advice or advocacy included that was only with specific reference to, to what is being devolved? No, um, I think the devolved system will always need um, advice and representation as well. Um, I'm sorry, that, that's what I was, I was saying. Yes. So, so. Even solely just in response to the, the devolved system, I think there will be need for advocacy and advice. Um, and I also think that advocacy and advice can be seen as an important positive for the system as well, because we're effectively there to test the regulations and see how far we can push them um, to get entitlement. Um, and that tests the system. Um, is it fit for purpose? Are the regulations fit for purpose? But also we are able to help clients present the best case possible at the earliest opportunity. So if they have advice and information, it means that the form will be well filled in. What we will be writing in the forum will be quite closely related to the regulations as well. Um, so the person's providing the, the most accurate information at the first point, and that can actually reduce the workload of decision makers and help us get the decision right first time as well. Um, advice and information networks can also build up referral routes and sources of evidence that can be really, really helpful um, in reducing cost and helping decision makers get things right first time. If a professional is referring to me, um, they will usually be happy to do me support and evidence as well, which can go in with initial application. That means a decision maker doesn't have to request that it cost. Um, and all of those things can actually help speed up and improve the accuracy. Um, so as well as being there to test and challenge the system, um, we're also there to help support people through it as well and to actually make decision makers' lives easier. Mm -hmm. okay. So, so what, what you're basically saying is that there is a need for both advocacy and advice because they're both different. Yes. Okay, that's fine. Um, Alison Johnson, you wanted to come in? Yeah, um, can, I, can I just ask um, on your views of the need to have the uprating of benefits on the face of the bill? Do you believe that benefits should be uprated annually and should that be on the face of the bill? Steve. Yes, um, we are quite clear that the reductions in uprating um, have led to quite a significant decrease in the income of the people that we support. Um, and it's been, I think, still the biggest individual saving in terms of the social security bill. That, that's, that's been the biggest cut. Um, and we definitely believe in the need for benefits to be uprated annually and that that should be on the bill. Maura, do you want to come in? I agree yeah. with that, that the, the annual uprating should be there for... And Bill? I think, I think one of the problems with the Bill is that it's a catch-all, and it, all the benefits and all the assistance um, are, are there, um, because we do believe in annual uprating, but if the nature of your benefits change in the future, that might not be how it's paid. And this is coming back to the cash or kind one. Mm. For example, in funeral payments, um, if at some point in the future, um, it's provided by other means. It may not be possible to uprate it if it's provided an in-kind support instead. Mm -hmm. um, so there, there is a problem, I think, and it is a catch-all bill rather than that there are individual pieces of legislation for each benefit. Um, but, I mean, it, like, you could address that through just saying that certain benefits will definitely be uprated annually. Um, for example, all the disability benefits do have that provision at, at Westminster at the moment. Um, and you know, we would like to see Carers, uh, Carers Alliance as well, including that. But you know, in general, we would, we would support uprating annually for all the benefits that are covered. But if there are proposals going to be brought forward at some point to change the nature of the benefits, that might need, then require a change in primary legislation. Thank you. Thank you. Adam Tonkin, you wanted to give a last short yes. question. Um, um, uh, there's another aspect um, that isn't in the bill, and I just wondered whether you think it should be. Uh, th there's no provision in the bill to enable uh, Scottish ministers to exercise their power under the Scotland Act 2016 to create new benefits. Mm. And I wondered whether you think that there should be such a provision in this bill. Bill Scott, do you want to come in first? Then? Yes. Uh, I think it, pr it should be on the face of the bill. I think um, it's, it's an important power, and I would I would like to see Scottish ministers taking it up. Um, I, you know, there have been instances in the past when people have been deprived of uh, assistance when they probably should have received it. Um, I think the kinship carers, uh, in particular, mm. um, but uh, there's. 
you know, there could be an instance in the future. So having that power on the face of the bill would at least allow ministers to, to exercise that power. Any other comments from the panel? Ben McPherson, you wanted to come in with a small supplementary. Uh, uh, apologies, Commissioner. I've got an, uh, 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 not a supplementary, I've another question. Um, um, just when you think that's appropriate. Okay. Oh, on you go then. Yeah, on you go. You sure? Yeah. Um, okay. Thank you, Convener. Um, just, uh, I know we touched on them earlier, uh, but I wanted to come back to section one about the principles. And um, I thought, Bill Scott, the submission uh, that, that you've made at 3.5 in your evidence around the proposed 1C principle around dignity and respect. I thought that was uh, quite uh, an interesting angle that you've taken there and I wondered if you could elaborate on it further. Yeah, um, essentially because British law at present is based on the European Convention uh, of Human Rights, um, when the Convention was put together, Social Security wasn't uppermost in, in the minds of legislators. And, and the European Court has proved, proven very reluctant to intervene where na uh, nation states have cut benefits and uh, cut benefit entitlement. Um, we do think there is a need to provide adequacy of support and, and uh, dignity and respect flow from that because if, if you're not getting adequate support, then you cannot maintain uh, your dignity and respect. Um, you, you know, you're reduced to being beholden to others to eat or to keep a roof over your head or to heat uh, your home. So um, we would like to see something on, on that on the face of the bill um, and uh, you know, to see that strengthened. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, can I thank the witnesses uh, for attending and uh, for, for the great uh, information that you've given us? Can, can, uh, can I make one offer? Um, the, we yes, have, we well, have provided amendments to the Minister and uh, the head of the bill team. We could, could we also forward those amendments to, to the chair? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely, that would be great. Thank you. Stephen wanted to come in Yep. Quickly, something we didn't get a chance to arrange. Um, quite important for us is the inclusion of mandatory reconsiderations in the bill prior to the appeal stage. Um, and we would like to see that removed um, and the return to the previous system where if the person disagreed with the system, they lodged an appeal, an internal reconsideration was conducted, and if a decision wasn't changed, then the person could go to a tribunal. Um, the stats from the mandatory reconsideration and the reserved system show that decision making didn't improve. What happened instead is the number of appeals reduced. And our concern is this is what would happen in the devolved system. And it's not that the decision making would have improved, it's that people who aren't supported or have other issues in their life at the time will fall out of the system. Um, and that it also increase, it places quite a high administrative burden on clients and also ourselves supporting clients because it means that we need to then keep track of when the decision came in, has the person appealed because there's time limits involved in all of this um, and it massively increases the workload of advice agencies as well as putting additional stress on clients. Um, and we don't think it's needed. We think an internal review process could be conducted to the same standard without having that process mandatory. Pauline, quick question. But it is a very important issue that you've raised at the, the end of the meetings. Sorry. I need to just be clear. Um, have you discussed this with ministers? And if you have done, what response are you getting to that point? Um, the response that we've received is that under the, res the uh, reserved system, that mandatory considerations were introduced with perhaps a more cynical purpose um, to reduce the number of appeals and that the devolved system would um, be better. Um, but there's not really anything concrete behind that to show why that would be the case. Um, and I think there was a recent policy paper as well, which was given the impression that the intention is to proceed with mandatory reconsiderations. Um, if the intention is to make decision making better in the first instance, then I don't see the need to have the review process have a mandatory second stage. Um, it just doesn't seem to me to have any sort of practical positive um, when the person can lodge the appeal and an internal review can be conducted in any case. Thank, thank you very much. And you got that well in there, Stephen, at the end, and we'll certainly look at that as well. Thank you. Uh, can I just suspend the meeting for a few minutes until the witnesses leave and a new group of witnesses come in? Thank you.
can I just uh, say thank you and welcome the second panel of witnesses, uh, Craig Smith, Policy Officer, Scottish Association for Mental Health, Peter Hasty, Campaigns Policy and Public Affairs Manager, Macmillan Cancer Support, and Hugh Robertson, Industrial Advisory Council. Uh, welcome and uh, thank you for coming along. I'll start with the first question. It will be similar to what I asked the previous panel. Uh, we've heard lots and lots of stuff about uh, you know, issues uh, within the proposed bill. Uh, I just wanted to ask your opinion, what you felt was um, the greatest strength of the, or weaknesses of the proposed bill in relation to the people that you represent. So I'll start off by Craig Smith. Do you want to come in first? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Um, I suppose very similar to the previous panel, um, definitely the biggest strength for us is the inclusion of the principles and the charter in the bill, um, particularly the principle of social security as a human right. Um, I think it's really welcome. Um, I think the rhetoric around the bill has been very welcome from the government as well. Um, and I suppose it, that kind of aligns to our greatest fear about the bill is the sense, and it's been discussed a lot um, by previous evidence and for the first panel, is that balance between primary and secondary legislation. While um, the principles are very well worded, we'd like to see an extra principle around promoting um, well-being and health through the social security system. Um, we think there are some big concerns around that balance between the primary and secondary legislation just to really get those principles and um, the charter really to have practical force for individuals using the system. Thank you very much, Craig. Um, Peter Hayes, did you want to come in on that one too? Thank you, Convener. Yes, Macmillan Cancer Support echoes a lot of those views. We're very positive about the entire way this bill was set up, all of the discussions around it. Um, and actually, you know, I started back in March 2016 when the Scottish Government released the Cancer Plan. They said that uh, you know, a welfare based on treating people with dignity and respect was in the actual cancer plan that said we want to fast track for those qualifying living with terminal illness such as cancer. So we're delighted that this bill takes that one in. And one of the things that we want to get over, Convener, is that we think it's more than just the job of this bill to have a good social security system in Scotland. We think it's up to the health service, private employers, mm -hmm. uh, third sector employers, state employers to support this bill, to support for instance, cancer patients staying in work. Mm -hmm. um, and so the cancer plan last March was using exactly the language of this bill, and we were delighted to see that. Uh, Hugh Robertson. Thanks. As a, a UK-wide um, government body, we don't think it's really appropriate for us to sort of tell the, the Scottish <laughs> Government what they should be doing. We're really here, I think, uh, mainly just to answer questions about the, the UK system in terms of, of employment uh, um, uh, injury assistance. So I don't think it would be appropriate. For me. Okay, we'll get a special question for you, Mr. Oh, Robertson. no, 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 I'm sure you are. <laughs> okay. Uh, Polly McNeil, you wanted to come in a particular one in this. Yes, good morning. Um, I wanted to ask you about the rules um, that should apply to the face of the bill on terminal illness. Um, so we've had some evidence that suggests that it's not defined on the face of the bill, so of course you'll know that it's a, it's a separate route for eligibility where there is a terminal illness. And the current Welfare Reform Act suggests, uh, says um, that anyone who suffers from a progressive disease and persons death in consequence of disease can reasonably be expected within six months. Um, I did also meet with Marie Curie yesterday, who um, have, um, have a view that that is far too prescriptive. And I wondered what your view, if you'd like to give evidence to the committee on that. Peter Hasty. Thank you, Camina. So um, there is a range of views on it. For cancer itself, um, the, the knowledge of the cancer pathway still remains within that six months. So broadly, the consultants, the clinical nurse specialists can know that the person should be in the last six months and therefore eligible for those benefits. And we're still comfortable that the cancer pathway is met by six months. Now, as more and more uh, drugs come into the system, as we get better and better at palliative care, as we detect cancer earlier, that may change. But for Macmillan at the moment, the cancer pathway is broadly well served with this. And, and as you know, it's not an exact six months. 
the consultant, the CNS, will give a, you know, a, a rough approximation. But for cancer patients at the moment, it serves as well. However, I think it would be fair to say that the representations that you got do show a different strand from other long-term conditions where um, the, the illness is different and a different trajectory from cancer. And I think perhaps the committee would need to take more from those individual long-term conditions and maybe collectively from some of their wider bodies. But just for cancer at the moment, at the moment we think we know that trajectory and the last six months of life. Obviously it's not an exact science um, and we hope that with greater palliative care and detecting cancer early, we will get there uh, for a longer period of support. But at the moment, six months seems to do the job well for cancer patients. And that's a very broad, does it okay, if you know what I mean. It's still a very difficult situation. So, 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 so you're content with the current definition as far as... But purely for cancer, purely for cancer patients, because the, the doctors can, yeah. can tell that trajectory. But you would acknowledge that there might be other conditions where a strict six-month rule might not be appropriate yes. definition. And, 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 we, and we see that with other conditions. I'm, I'm afraid I'm just not an expert on those, but I think it is right that other yeah. long-term conditions... I'm sorry, I had to ask you this because uh, Marie Curie were not able to give evidence and I yeah. just wanted to make sure that Absolutely. all the uh, organisations who have a view on this can have a chance Absolutely. to... But no, that's helpful. Thank, Thank you very much. Craig Smith, would you want to come in? No, no, I think no? I'm covered fine. Okay. Adam Tompkins wants to come in. Thank you, yeah, Convener. Um, and good morning, everyone. I, I want to take up the point that um, Mr Smith uh, mentioned in his opening um, remarks a few minutes ago about the relationship in the bill between primary and secondary legislation. So we've already heard that you have a number of concerns that the balance in the bill is not quite right. Could you just descend into a bit, a bit more detail about that, th this and give us um, a chapter and verse, as it were, on the sorts of things that are not in the bill that should be, or indeed conversely, the sorts of things that are in the bill and should, and, and, and should not be, just so that we can understand this in as much detail as possible? Um, yes, of course. So a number of, most of my comments will be around the disability benefits aspect of the bill. Um, key concerns and some of them were raised in the first panel, would definitely be a clear purpose for each of the individual benefits that are covered, um, and a clear definition of disability as well. It's sort of implicit in the bill and the policy memorandum that we're using the Equality Act definition of disability. We'd like that to be very firmly placed in, in the phrase, face of the bill. And um, beyond that, in our written evidence, we've talked about principles of assessment. While there definitely needs to be a balance with secondary legislation and an understanding that huge screeds of detail around how individual um, assessments are going to be undertaken is not the right place for that to be in the primary legislation. We'd like to see so much more principles around assessments. So um, key for us would be that assessments should be broadly paper-based, um, face-to-face, where there's only a real need for that, that to be face-to-face. -face. Um, that assessments should be undertaken by people with professional background or experience in the conditions that are the primary condition of the applicant. Um, and also more detail and eligibility criteria should be in the face of the bill as well. And is that also the view of the other, other, other witnesses? I'll go, um, the, the balance of the bill, I think, um, you know, we had a lot of trouble uh, trying to understand exactly some of the motives of the bill. It's obviously written in parliamentary language. It isn't necessarily the expertise of Macmillan. Um, we come to the bill with a lot of good faith. Mm -hmm. um, and therefore, we think that the bill um, allows the right judgments to be taken, whether or not they're taken on the face of the bill or you know, by parliament and then by government ministers um, secured by parliament. It's very difficult for an organisation, and even within Macmillan, we have varying views that I will come to uh, perhaps later on in this on that. But as it stands, the bill does a lot and it understands a lot of what we have brought forward in our submission on maybe it's more the reality of the cancer patient's journey through the benefit system, um, perhaps rather than the technical legislative nature of it. But we think a lot of it understands that uh, real life, real society person's view of working their way through a new benefit system. Um, yes. Come back again briefly. I would agree with much of what, what Peter said and definitely um, we're broadly, broadly very happy with the approach the government have taken in general on social security. I suppose some of the key kind of concerns about 
if it's not in primary legislation, why we're concerned, um, it would come round to the the level of scrutiny that can be undertaken in secondary legislation, and why, while it's it's good that the affirmative <coughs> procedure and the super affirmative procedure appears to be um, being put in place for the development and passing of regulations, Parliament will still not be able to amend regulations that are and that are scrutinised. Um, we're still not hugely clear from the government about the level of scrutiny that will be open to the public on individual regulations. And I suppose our concern stems from some of the experience that we've had with the UK system. So in November, where the upper tribunal um, changed some of the conditions around PIP for people with um, psycho in psychological distress and travel um, and reduced entitlement, the government changed that very quickly down in Westminster in February, um, changed the regulations, and we wouldn't like to see something like that happening to the system here. Um, so I suppose while we have, we're very positive about the approach of the government's taking, it's, it's that future proofing as well, which is our concern and why we'd like to see a wee bit more in, in the primary legislation, including things like um, timescales for um, awards and things like that. We, we're very much welcome the fact that redeterminations have a timescale in the bill, and we think that should be expanded to other aspects of the system. Th thank you, final question for me. Would you like to see in the bill um, express provision for the creation of new benefits? Yes. I, I can give you a huge um, example of what new benefits we'd like to see right now, but <laughs> yes, I please. think... Yeah, no, actually, that, that would actually be helpful, yes, please. Yes. Um, I, I mean, I, I couldn't give you a huge amount of detail of specific new benefits we'd like to see, but I think it's a big gap in the bill that that provision is not, not put there. In terms of topping up existing benefits, I have more detail about that. We would definitely like to see the government... Um, move to top up um, reserve benefits, so ESA RAG, um, where there was a £30 cut to people on ESA RAG, bringing it to the level of GSA. Um, recently, we'd like to see the Scottish Government move to, to mitigate that and, and, and put in place a top up there. And again, around the kind of changes to PIP that um, happened earlier on this year. But, but in principle, it's a gap in the bill that the, the, there's not provisions put in for new benefits. I think if the um, the committee thought that was the only way to do it. We'd absolutely want the committee to do that. We think if the committee and then the parliament comes to a judgment that that can be done, for instance, on ESA RAG, um, if, the, if the committee and the parliament comes to a decision that that can be done uh, through other mechanisms, really for Macmillan Cancer Support, the chance to uh, top up, reinstate, recover, you name it, but to support the cancer patient who's just had their £30 a week loss, um, we put it into to your hands and we, um, and we trust this committee and the parliament to do the right thing for cancer patients. Um, like I said earlier, we are not experts in legislation, but we do believe that if that is the only mechanism, we think it should be there. But we also think the parliament and the government can support cancer patients using this tool um, to support them. And therefore, um, we leave it in your hands. I think just for the record, Camilla, it's important to note that you know, there's a difference between the power to top up and the power to create new benefits, and there is a provision in the bill about the power to top up, but there isn't a provision in the bill about the power to create new benefits. So it's important to bear those, that distinction in mind. But thank you very much for your help. Thank you. Uh, Jeremy Balfour, you wanted to come in? Uh, thank you, Camilla, and good morning, everybody. I, I've got a couple of questions. Maybe start with Craig and then Craig and Peter and Hugh for the second question. Um, I mean, my own experience is that those that come to DLA or now come to PIP who have mental health conditions are often the ones that find it most difficult. Um, and I suppose on that, two areas just to explore. And we, we, you would have heard in the first panel, we had a, a bit of a discussion around advocacy and representation. I'd be interested to know, particularly for the people that you're representing, would you have a view on whether that should be on the face of the bill? Uh, and the second one, and this gets probably down to the actual integrity of how it works, if it's going to be in the bill or more likely within regulations, do you think there should be a separate category for those who have mental health issues rather than trying to fit them into categories which are predominantly around physical disability? Uh, and my second question is, perhaps even at Peter, in, uh, is, is in regard to residency. At the moment, there's no definition of residency of where you live within the bill. And there may well be somebody who has got a, a diagnosis of cancer that, for family reasons or whatever, moves north or south of the border. Do you think that needs to be covered so that we don't have to, particularly if you've got a terminal illness, 
maybe start in Aberdeen but move to family in Carlisle. Does that need to be covered in my bill at somewhere as well? Yeah, of course. So in the first point of advocacy, um, yeah, we're very clear we'd like to see that um, a right to independent advocacy for all individuals engaging with the social security system placed in the, in the bill. And we think there's really good precedence for that in mental health law. So the Mental Health Act um, has a very similar provision where there's a right to advocacy um, for everyone who has a mental health disorder, um, irrespective of if they're being treated under the Act. Um, so, yeah, that's a clear one that we'd like to see. We think if we're really going to embed a human rights approach, advocacy is really key. Um, there's a very good evidence base around the imp positive impact of advocacy and social security, as we've heard earlier today. We know the Scottish Government funded a welfare advocacy pilot a couple of years ago, um, which funded some local advocacy projects to deliver um, specialist welfare advice advocacy for individuals undertaking ESA and PIP applications and assessments, and the impact of that on individuals' confidence, on the quality of decision making, um, was quite stark. So we think there is a, a really clear role for advocacy, um, and that should be in the face of the bill as a right, and we think that would really be one aspect that can help embed a human rights approach um, to the system. On the second point, um, it's a really interesting question about a separate category for, for mental health um, under disability benefits, and it's something we've discussed a lot, actually, internally. Um, I suppose for us, what's really key, as in some ways that would be a, a, a very good approach to have a kind of dedicated mental health stream that people would go through um, if that was a primary condition. I suppose for us, what's, what's most important and what would probably alleviate the need for that um, would be the quality of assessments, information gathering. So for us, um, I, I would say a, a fairly wide consensus across kind of disability groups is the need to move away from a kind of face-to-face -face assessment by default to one that's looking much more at paper base, much more a, a whole body of evidence around the, for, around the individual and the impact their disability and their mental health problems um, are having on their life. So we would like to see a system where, where that is really key. And one of our slight concerns at the moment, though we've heard very good things from government um, around this, is where the liability for collection of that evidence lies. We know in the current system where some people are charged for additional evidence, um, where some people struggle to gather evidence on their path because of their condition. Um, there can be big problems and gaps of evidence, which is then leading to people going to appeal um, and tribunal. We would like to see the agency have a much stronger role in gathering that evidence on behalf of the individual, where the individual has given consent and possibly identified key sources for that evidence. So where quality evidence is, is being gathered from, possibly from CPN, psychiatrists, from family and friends, which I think is really important, people who really know that individual. And obviously the individual the individual themselves is really key. Um, their understanding of the impact of their health complaint um, on them, we think that could make a big difference to decision making. And where face-to-face -face assessments possibly did have to happen, we think they really should be undertaken by people with a mental health background if that's the primary um, condition that someone has. And we think that would go a long way to increasing um, the quality and the experience of assessments, because we know currently the experience assessments is, can be very damaging for individuals who are undertaking them. Thank you. Hopefully that answers your question. Could, could, sorry, could, could I bring in Mr Robertson perhaps at this, this particular point? Because I, I know in the submission Sam H mentioned post-traumatic stress disorder uh, and they said this should perhaps be looked at. Uh, but you're, in your own submission or what you mentioned was that the I, IIAC have considered uh, this issue and not found sufficient evidence to recommend changing the criteria uh, and also obviously the, the fact that the Scotland Act 2016 prevents the UK industry's uh, advisory council from providing advice to the Scottish ministers. So it's kind of two-pronged question, comments on what was said previously in Sam H and do you have a view on how the council's functions could be provided in Scotland within this bill, Mr Robertson? Yes, I mean, um, it's quite a long Long thing. So I'll start off with the mental health issues, if that's yes. okay, Chair. Um, and the, the, the thing is, we have looked at it, and um, the problem is that um, it's not a sickness benefit. It's an actual fact. What it is, it's a compensation or, um, or um, a payment scheme for disabilities that are caused by work. Now, in terms of most mental health disorders, you know, roughly a third of them do have a work component. 
but to actually say this person was, had their mental health problems caused purely by work is very, very difficult. Um, and so we did a report which was actually published just last month on uh, one group, which was um, teachers and healthcare workers, which we felt, you know, there's got to be good evidence there. You know, we know what all the anecdotal uh, stories were. And because um, stress and anxiety are so common among the general population, what we couldn't find is they were more than twice as likely to. And so if you're saying it's, it's more likely than not to be caused by work, you have to get that kind of doubling. And it's just not there, um, unfortunately. Um, the other thing, of course, is that the mental health disorders caused by work primarily are treatable. They are, you can actually um, sort of, people can recover from them. And we don't want it to be seen as being a dis disability because that sort of medicalizes it, institutionalizes it. And what we want to do is empower people to actually feel they're, they're, they want to get back to work, they want to get well, rather than see themselves as victims. Uh, that said, um, the other issue is that, you know, it is preventable. And there's no link between the current industrial diseases system and, you know, the, the workplace and the employer, which means there's no real incentive. You know, the, the Scottish Government could end up paying large sums of money in, in terms of, of uh, benefit to these people, but the thing is, you know, what are you going to do to actually prevent it? And the scheme doesn't really do that. Um, so when we did look at it, we did look at PTSD and say, yes, that is different. Uh, because it's a one-off issue which can be very, very disabling, which is why we said it may not be uh, applicable um, under the, um, the occupational diseases scheme, but it is applicable under the accident provision. So if someone does have a PTSD um, and it's a one-off event, they can claim a benefit under the accident provision. So um, I think that's probably the, the, a reasonable um, approach to it, um, because you know it is it is a different a different state of, of mental health issues. In terms of um, what kind of model you should have, I'm, I mean you have got a fantastic um, uh, amount of um, of occupational medical uh, um, experience and skills in Scotland. Just down the road, you've got the Institute of Medicine. Um, you've got effectively the father of occupational medicine, um, 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 Ewan MacDonald, who set up Scottish Healthy Working Lives in Scotland. Uh, you've got professors of, of occupational medicine and so on, but um, uh, both in, in Glasgow and, and Aberdeen. But um, the, the thing is that in setting up a committee to deal with it, it's not primarily the medical approach that you need. It's the epidemiologists, the people who are actually going to look at the evidence out there across the world and say, is that evidence showing that it's more likely than not for certain occupations mm -hmm. to have developed um, this particular disease because of their work? And um, the, the difficulty is if initially you, you use the same criteria in Scotland as there is in, going to be in England and Wales and is, is applied in, in Northern Ireland, then if you've got two committees looking at exactly the same diseases on a scientific basis and coming out with different decisions, you've got problems. Mm -hmm. um, now that's more reflection of whether or not in the long term uh, you're going to just use a 71-year-old system which is what we've got in England and Wales, which was set up for a completely different purpose, a completely different, different workforce before uh, the priorities were uh, um, the occupational health things we've got now, or whether you're going to have your own one. So initially, I think there is an issue of how you're going to have two parallel committees looking at exactly the same issues. But in the long term, I think it's a question of the, 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 the Scottish Government actually uh, deciding what kind of system it wants to evolve in for the modern Scottish workplace and have a group that's appropriate to that. What we found is that having a mixture of, um, of academics, uh, a lawyer, and people who know the world of work, both as representatives of employers and employees, has worked fantastically well. And we very rarely have disputes within the council. I've been on since 1999. And, uh, you know, we don't normally disagree because we go where the evidence takes us, whether we like it or not. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't like the decision we made on teachers and healthcare workers and stress, but it's what the evidence actually shows us. And the evidence won't be different whether it's being looked at in Scotland or in London. And that's where we've got the problem. 
Thank, thank you so much, Mr. Robertson. I did see we would specifically get a question no, uh, for you. But, uh, yeah, it's been very interesting because, obviously, you would not assume, but if you've, you've looked at evidence and you have advice, then perhaps we're working together with the new Social Security Agency to receive that advice. But what you're saying is it's better to have them separate? Or would you be saying that, uh, you know, <laughs> you would be giving that advice if you were asked... I mean, you've talked about mm -hmm. post-traumatic stress disorder. I mean, that is recognised now. Uh, so, therefore, mm -hmm. if it was a disability, you would be getting a, you know, a benefit, as they call it, so security in that respect. But the evidence would be provided by, uh, you know, the committee. We've, we've been told we can't give that advice to Scotland. Right. I mean, we can't really comment on that. That is what we have been told. Um, once uh, Scotland takes um, over a, a, a devolution for... Uh, industrial injuries benefit, or, or as you're calling it, employee welcoming, <laughs> a, a welcome, uh, calling it employee injury assistance, then we can no longer give advice. But the reality is the diseases, occupational diseases in Scotland are not going to be different from the occupational diseases in England. So I think it's the initial period um, when you're going to be mirroring the, uh, the, the scheme in England and Wales um, where there are going to be reports coming from the Industrial Injury Advisory Council in England and Wales on issues and what Scotland is going to do, whether it's just going to accept these reports and put them into Scottish regulation, mm -hmm. whether or not you're going to set up either as a subcommittee of the Social Security uh, Committee or as a separate one, your own specialist one. Um, that, I mean, we can't really advise you, but we can just say that because they're meant to be evidence-based academic ones, you know, the, 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 the problems would arise if they looked at the same things and got totally different con conclusions. That shouldn't happen. But is it a, a useful use of Scotland's resources to do that? That's your decision, I'm afraid. Sorry. Um, thank you very much for that, anyway. I'm, I'm sure we'll reflect on that uh, in, in the committee as well. Um, the next day, uh, Alison Johnson, you wanted to come in? Oh, I'm sorry. Just say for the record that I, I forgot to declare this at the start, my apologies, that I did sit on PIP tribunals and DLA tribunals and I'm in receipt of PIP. Just for the record, apologies for that. No, not at all. Thank you, Mr Balfour. Alison Johnson. Yeah, um, thank you. Um, Peter Hasty, you, you commented earlier on the fact that the Social Security Bill um, has obviously a hugely important role to play, but it's society at large can contribute to, to a good system. And you reference um, work going on at the spinal unit at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Glasgow, um, showing that there's a real opportunity to change how decisions are made for people with long-term conditions, working closely with physios, nurseries, and so on, um, that could have a real impact on the way we assess these conditions in the first place. Just wonder if you could give us a little bit more information on how that worked. Absolutely. I, I don't want to make up a new phrase, but I think there's something about... Uh, pre-advocacy that we could be interested in here. You know, in our submission, we talked a lot of the work we've done with the UK government, sometimes defensively, sometimes positively, changing the nature of cancer patients' claims. And so a Macmillan phone line is now credited by the DWP to fast-track these payments. And the Scottish government, the only part of the UK that's done this, uh, helped fund Macmillan's benefits advisors in the five cancer centres across Scotland in 2008. Mm -hmm. And this was about changing the nature of somebody's benefits journey. And if you ever wanted to visit one in the, the Western General, the, you know, the, the staff literally go around, the benefit staff literally go around the chemotherapy ward and get them filling in the forms there. And, and you know somebody going through chemo couldn't go up to the advice centre on the high street and things like that. And the model at the Queen Elizabeth has tried to model itself on Macmillan's benefits model that says, we'll take the advice into the hospital. We'll fast track that form and we'll avoid all the face to face assessments because you can trust the judgment of the consultant and the CNS that this person going through chemotherapy is clearly not able to work. And so, what the Queen Elizabeth has done has built on that model that says if we can surround the patient, normally for McMillan it's cancer, but there it's the long term conditions, we can support them through that journey. And I am really passionate about the, the changes there is in the nature of people going back to work. Um, as the state retirement age rises to 68, cancer is going to be more and more of a working age illness. You know, maybe back in the day, if you got it when you were 60, well, you were just about retirement age and 
you know, you could get your pension, but not anymore. And so we need to get people back to work. And that chimes nicely with the fact that survival rates are growing massively. The, the next Scottish, Scottish cancer survival rates are out in January. And once again, they will show increased one, two, five, and 10 year survival. We'd like them to be more, but that's for another committee. And I think if you can surround the cancer patient or the person with a long-term condition with physio, with vocational rehabilitation, and all of that that brings within the health service, within their workplace, we can take them, not necessarily just always out of the benefit system, but we can keep them away from the benefit system as long as possible. And I think there's so many roles for so many professionals in our society to support the person with the illness, to not need always the support of the benefit system. Thank you. Um, can I just address a question in particular, I think, to, to Craig Smith? Um, when you were asked, uh, uh, when the session opened, about the strengths of the bill, I, th I think you actually specifically mentioned the Charter. Um, I, I'd, I'd just like your views on whether or not you think the bill provides a framework of rights and a mechanism of redress that a benefit applicant could rely on if they felt that their rights weren't being fully respected. Um, no, not at the moment. Um, I think very much welcome the fact that there, there will be a charter and the bill stipulates that there will be a charter and we'd very much like to see that um, co-produced with the experience panels but um, with a wider or, or audience of stakeholders. Um, and something I reflect in, in our submission is we'd like that to be... Um, to, to reflect the fact that over 39%, over 30% of people receiving PIP have a mental health problem as a main condition, so our, the mental health population needs to be reflected. To the main point about redress, that is one of our kind of one of our concerns. So as we're very very much welcome, um, the principles as they're written, um, the the legislative promise that there will be a charter developed. Um, what is currently missing is avenues for redress. And if we want to have a system based on human rights, we need to have accountability um, and scrutiny and, and redress as well. So I think there needs to be a wee bit of clarity around, are these principles systemic or are these principles for the individual? Is a charter going to be for enshrining the, these rights um, and principles for the individual? And if they are, which they should do, um, there must be an avenue for individuals to complain or take legal redress where they feel um, that their rights under the principles and subsequently under the Charter um, aren't being adhered to by the state, by the, by the Social Security Agency. Um, we're hopeful that that can be developed. We'd like to see um, further clarity from the government around that. I think it's a concern not just raised by us, but kind of quite wide across um, the disability third sector around um, there is a wee bit of gaps there around redress. And that's a really crucial one, actually. People need to be able to get redress where they feel that their rights have been breached. Thank you. Anybody else want to come in from me? Ruth Maguire, you want to come in with supplementary? Yeah, thank you, Convener. I suppose it's just following on from what, what Craig Smith said there. If the Charter was to be legally enforceable, the obvious disadvantage to me would feel like it's going to have to be drafted as a legal document, and that detracts from the purpose of it, which was for it to be accessible and easy to read and, and not legalistic and co-produced, as, as you suggested you want it. Would you reflect on that at all? I think that's a big challenge. Um, and I think it's a balance that needs to be to be got. I, I can't say I've got the, the answer. I do think we would err on the fact that it does need to have mechanisms of redress in some way. Um, but it does need to be accessible. The charter should be for everyone using the system and the system itself. And we're very clear that it should be co-produced. So it's a, it's a really good question. It's a really difficult one to answer. Um, we wouldn't like it to, to become winding, window dressing to a system. And there's no, and I'm certainly not suggesting that is the intention or that is what would happen. But um, we have seen charters and other legislation which maybe haven't had the impact that, that they could, or, could have had. So it's how to get that balance. Um, yeah, but I think redress still is, is quite a key, a key one in individuals' right to address. Okay. okay, Ben McPherson. Thank you, Convener. Uh, Peter Hastie, just interested to, to get your thoughts on this question. Um, you stated in your, uh, or Macmillan stated in their evidence about the, the fast-tracking element for those who qualify and are living with a terminal illness such as cancer. Um, other similar organisations, uh, for example, Marie Curie, have suggested that perhaps there should be mention of the fast-tracking element 
in the primary legislation. Uh, do you have a, a view about where, where or if uh, such uh, a right to fast tracking or, or, or a statement about fast tracking should be included? <coughs> um, it's hasty. Thank you. I, I think it would be, uh, when we've been thinking about this, it, I can't think of a, a, a situation where I've ever come across where people don't just normally accept that terminal is different from other forms. And we push the UK government all the time to speed up payments all the time, but we have most success when we're talking about terminal illness. And I think most people uh, would just normally accept that the system would have a different criteria. So many Scots, despite the brilliant work of Detect Cancer Early, are diagnosed very close to the end of life. And I think most people accept that a terminal diagnosis that is six months, and very, very often a lot less than six months, should have a, a shorter time frame uh, built into the system than, I say, a normal terminal, uh, you know, a normal diagnosis, but you, you get my point. Um, I'm not clear that that has to be, because I think the nature of, of terminal illnesses, as I alluded to by um, Paul McNeil, will change over the period of time. Um, and therefore, I think you wouldn't want to tie your hands too hard. Um, but I still, th I, I think this committee and the Parliament also send a very strong message that every system that there's ever been accepts that terminal illnesses has to be fast tracked um, ahead of the others. We'd love all benefits to be processed within 24 hours for everybody, but I think it's pretty clear that some of the seven-day targets that are set up are been met. Um, we would not want the bill to do away with some of the targets that have been set recently by Westminster and hard fought. A couple of my colleagues, Emma Cross and Grace Brownfield, have fought so hard for years at Westminster to get these targets put in place. But we don't perceive for a moment that this bill would do anything other than keep going with those targets and keep publishing those statistics so that you as a committee can hold ministers' feet to the fire when those quarterly statistics are published the way we currently do at Westminster. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Convener. Ruth McGuire, did you wish to come in on advocacy? Did you mention? Um, I could do. Oh, sorry, I, I, had I, your think, name, I had your name down here <laughs> under advocacy. So. It was the first panel coming out. To be honest, I think actually um, the panel have, have reflected on advocacy and advice and their evidence already. So oh, okay. thank you for that. Rem remiss of me. Could I just ask, you know, obviously this question has been asked on numerous occasions as well, and uh, obviously it's between the primary and secondary legislation and the face of the bill. Um, Having had evidence from numerous, obviously, groups, etc., most of them say that uh, their particular one they would like on the face of the bill. Uh, can, can you explain why it's so important to have it in that type of legislation rather than the legislation that's been put forward uh, at the moment in the bill, uh, that it's um, easier to change rather than going through the full process of Parliament if it's actually on the face of the bill. Could you maybe explain to us in, in respect, in simple terms, <laughs> I'll give it to Craig Smith first. I think um, while regulations certainly are easier to change and quicker to change, for us the concern is the scrutiny aspect and that's really key for us. So while of course primary legislation is a much more form it's a, it's a longer process. That's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, it allows a proper public consultation and it around allows Parliament um, to amend um, any changes as well as just passing or rejecting them. Um, and for us, that, that is really the key thing. Um, so that's why, while kind of, again, we, we fully understand that in a complex social security system, you can't have every single detail on the face of a bill that it would become unmanageable. That's why for us it's really important that it is the kind of key eligibility um, and assessment um, and timescales, the kind of key principles to provide that framework for the further regulation um, to go. But for us, it's, it's a, scrutiny is a, is a real concern for us and the experience, as I said, of changes to PIP in the past re regulation, which we, we felt were very damaging changes and um, without any public scrutiny um, is a kind of a warning for us that we need to future-proof the legislation. Um, and while, again, we very much welcome the, the tone of debate actually um, from the government and actually fairly cross-party tone of debate around Social Security in Scotland since before the publication of the bill, um, we don't know that if that level of discourse is always going to be there and it's important that safeguards are put in place and that's why um, we feel the balance still isn't isn't quite there between the primary and the secondary legislation. So scrutiny is, is really scrutiny important. Scrutiny is really important and for you us. you believe that scrutiny 
obviously if it's on the face of the bill, um, the scrutiny, scrutiny will come along. Yeah. Uh, even if anyone, you have an, if you have an independent scrutiny board, yeah, you don't think that's enough. Um, we we definitely agree there should be an independent scrutiny board, um, but actually having that public level of scrutiny is really important for us too. So yeah. Okay. Peter Hayes, did you want to come in on that particular one? And then for me, Ben McPherson wanted to. Sorry, for me, I certainly wouldn't want to contradict that. We haven't asked for this because maybe it's just because I'm so long in the tooth now, but I'm fairly sure there'll be more bills coming along in front of this committee on social security as the years, years go on. Uh, and the scrutiny uh, Macmillan will bring to this for cancer patients will be uh, a committee in front of the parliament, outside the parliament building. So we haven't called for things on the face of the bill because the nature of cancer is changing so much and in a good way um, that we'd be concerned if we tried to pin up every single one of our beliefs on the face of this bill and then come back to you in six months' time going, we've got a new one. Um, so I'm, I, you know, I'm not an expert about putting something on the face of the bill and I'm not I, speaking against it, but um, we, we're st strongly of the belief that um, it's non-stop, the changes to the welfare system for cancer patients. You know, the survival rates are, are incredible. We, we, I couldn't have told you that five years ago. Mm -hmm. you know. Some, something might even change in the bill that would concern Mr Robertson's uh, committee. You never know. Uh, I'm, just, I'm just bringing you back into that, obviously, with the, the, you know, the stress, post-traumatic stress, that type of thing. You know, that, that's the kind of feeling that I've had from a number of uh, you know, contributors. Uh, things are changing all the time in the welfare, uh, and it would take so long if it was on the face of the bill, but that's for the committee uh, to make up their mind when they put it forward. Um, and you want to come in, Ben McPherson? Peter, just very quickly, I know a number of you were in the audience listening to the, the first panel where there was some discussion about the, a commitment from the Minister to use the super affirmative procedure for secondary legislation. Would uh, that reassure you? Uh, Definitely very welcome, yeah. Um, it does provide that greater level of, of debate over, it, of, over regulation. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'd still say I would need to reflect on that a wee bit more. I think there's still certain areas we would like to see in the face of the bill, um, but I think that's a very welcome step if the minister's deciding to go down that route to take the super affirmative approach. Thank you, Kim. Uh, thank you, Ms McPherson. Can I just pack, thank the panel uh, very much indeed for the evidence and uh, close the meeting and uh, into private session now. Thank you. <laughs>